everybody and welcome to lesson 2.3, The Dynamic Atmosphere. The content in this video is aligned to the third edition of Environmental Science for AP and covers information from College Board Units 4.4, and 9.4. The next dynamic system that makes life available on planet Earth is the atmosphere. It is this composition of gases and aerosols that provide many of the resources that we need to survive. This leads us to the content objective of understanding that Earth's systems interact, resulting in a state of balance over time. That most of the Earth's atmospheric processes are driven by input of energy from the sun, and local and regional human activities can have impacts at the global level. At the end of this lesson, you should be able to describe the structure and composition of the Earth's atmosphere, explain how environmental factors can result in atmospheric circulation, explain how the sun's energy affects the Earth's surface, differentiate between weather and climate, Describe how Earth's geography affects weather and climate. Describe the environmental changes and effects that result from El Nino or La Nina events, the El Nino Southern Oscillation. Explain the importance of stratospheric ozone to life on Earth. Explain the process of ozone depletion. Identify greenhouse gases and identify the sources and potency of greenhouse gases. This leads us to being able to answer our guiding question. How is the atmosphere a dynamic system? The atmosphere is a mixture of gases in a composition that is almost perfect for the support of life. The majority of the atmosphere, about 78%, is diatomic nitrogen, or N2. Oxygen makes up 21%, and the remaining 1% is a combination of argon, carbon dioxide, and other trace gases like methane, water vapor, and ozone. There are five layers to the atmosphere, each with a specific function. The troposphere is the layer closest to the surface of the Earth. This is where we live and where weather occurs. The troposphere is about eight to 10 kilometers thick. Next is the stratosphere, which houses the ozone layer that filters out various types of ultraviolet radiation. The mesosphere is where meteorites tend to burn up before reaching the surface. The thermosphere comes next, where ions interact with incoming solar radiation to form things like the northern lights. Lastly, there's the exosphere, which is the upper limit of the atmosphere where it meets open space. Each layer of the atmosphere serves a particular function and they are connected together through a pattern of temperature shifts. Notice in the graph that the troposphere, as altitude increases, the temperature decreases until it reaches the tropopause, or the boundary between the stratosphere and the troposphere. Here, temperature stabilizes before increasing once again. Remember that the stratosphere houses the ozone layer, which provides some temperature inflation. The temperature will increase until it meets the stratopause, where the stratosphere and mesosphere meet. Here we see the pattern repeated where increasing altitude leads to decreasing temperatures. The mesosphere meets the thermosphere at the mesopause. Throughout the thermosphere and exosphere, the temperature will continue to increase with altitude until it meets open space. The structure of the atmosphere interacts with a variety of conditions that form the processes that drive the system. One of the major conditions that plays a role in solar radiation. In the form of ultraviolet radiation, solar rays reach the Earth and strike various points at different angles. Remember that the Earth is tilted on its axis at about 23 and a half degrees. The most direct sunlight hits the equator, with rays concentrated over smaller areas. As one moves through increasing latitudes from the equator to the poles, the angle of solar radiation increases, leading to rays being spread over larger areas. This uneven distribution of solar radiation contributes to the uneven heating of the Earth's surface, which leads to the formation of wind patterns and other atmospheric processes. In addition to the angle of incoming radiation, 
the Earth has a wide variety of surfaces with varying albedos. Albedo is the measurement of the reflectivity of the Earth and is measured on a scale of 0 to 1, with 0 indicating that no solar rays are reflected and 1 indicating that all rays are reflected. Darker objects like asphalt absorb solar energy while things like ice and snow reflect it. As overall global temperature becomes increasingly warm, the ice and snow at the polar caps melts, which reduces the albedo of the surface. This leads to warming waters and a positive feedback loop that contributes to the reduce in snow and ice cover. It's important to note that solar radiation is not just absorbed by the various structures of Earth. It can be reflected back from objects with a high albedo, such as ice, snow, and clouds, or be absorbed into the variety of components of the atmosphere. The radiation, however, is also re-radiated back from the surface through long wave infrared radiation. This process of accounting for incoming solar radiation, its use, and its re-radiation is called Earth's energy budget. Strongly associated with the Earth's energy budget is the greenhouse effect. It is important to note that the greenhouse effect is required for life on Earth to exist. It maintains a stable temperature by reflecting radiation in the form of infrared radiation from the surface of the Earth back into the atmosphere where it is reflected back by greenhouse gases such as CO2 and CH4, or methane. These greenhouse gases form a blanket around the Earth and help to prevent all of the re-radiated heat from escaping back into space. This leads to the development of a relatively constant overall global temperature. Human action, however, has accelerated the greenhouse effect. Note that anthropogenic greenhouse effect is an enhanced version of the natural greenhouse effect. Actions such as the combustion of fossil fuels, industrial animal farming, and deforestation lead to excessive amounts of CO2, methane, and nitrogen oxide, and other greenhouse gases to settle in the atmosphere. In this way, the blanket of gases around the Earth gets thicker, which in turn reflects more of the re-radiated heat from the incoming solar radiation. This leads to an increase in overall global temperatures. Anthropogenic greenhouse effect is one of the key drivers of overall global climate change. In 1997, 150 countries met in Kyoto, Japan to draft what became known as the Kyoto Protocol. This was an agreement between the signatory countries to reduce carbon dioxide emissions by a minimum of 5%. The protocols went into effect in 2005. In 2015, the Paris Accords were drafted to continue to combat global climate change and prevent an increase in overall temperature from reaching 2 degrees Celsius. The Accords are ambitious and are one of the first legally binding documents drafted by global entities to address climate change. It's important to understand the different greenhouse gases and their origins in order to understand how we might combat overall global climate change through the increased greenhouse effect. The four major greenhouse gases are CO2, methane, nitrous oxide, and a variety of fluorinated gases such as CFCs and HCFCs. Notice that the majority of the human-caused greenhouse gases comes from carbon dioxide, the major byproduct of burning fossil fuels. Carbon dioxide is also a reference molecule which we use to determine what is known as the global warming potential, or GWP. As you can see from the graph, methane is able to prevent 25 times more re-radiated heat from exiting the atmosphere as carbon dioxide. It is common to confuse the greenhouse effect and its blanket of gases with the ozone layer. However, these are two completely separate entities. The ozone layer is an area of accumulation of the ozone molecule, a triatomic oxygen, or O3. Ozone's primary purpose in the atmosphere is to filter out incoming ultraviolet radiation. Of the three major types, the ozone layer completely filters out UVC and the majority of UVB. However, UVA is able to penetrate the ozone layer. This kind of UV radiation is responsible for things such as skin cancer, and mutation in plants. While the ozone layer prevents large amounts of UV radiation from reaching the surface, 
it also makes use of it. The reaction that naturally forms and decays ozone is catalyzed by ultraviolet radiation. Put simply, diatomic oxygen, or O2, is bonded to a free oxygen atom through the catalyzation of UV light. The same process can decay ozone by stripping a free oxygen from the triatomic structure. Here you see the formulas for natural ozone formation and destruction on the right. The bottom formula for each component is the one that you should be able to reproduce when questioned. Ozone is destroyed in another way, which has led to a thinning of the layer over time. This is through ozone depletion, which is driven by the presence of fluorinated gases in the atmosphere. In particular, the compound chlorofluorocarbon, or CFC, previously used in refrigerants and coolants, is a serious contributor to this depletion. CFCs has a shelf life of around 50 years in the atmosphere, and a single molecule of CFC can destroy over 100,000 molecules of ozone. In the atmosphere, UV radiation catalyzes the breakdown of CFCs, which releases a chlorine atom. This atom attracts an ozone and strips away an oxygen. The chlorine then releases the oxygen atom, which reacts with another free oxygen in the atmosphere to form diatomic oxygen. In this way, free oxygen atoms are no longer available for the formation of ozone, leading to a thinning of the ozone layer. It is important to note that this thinning often takes place faster than the normal formation can match, and it is much more evident in the summer months as solar radiation is more direct. In 1987, the Montreal Protocols were designed to phase out the use of CFCs in these processes. CFCs were replaced by HCFCs, or halogenated CFCs, which were found to have similar problems as traditional CFCs. Uneven heating of the Earth's surface contributes to the movement of air in the atmosphere. We know that convection causes warm fluids to rise and cooler fluids to sink due to changes in density. The gases in the atmosphere are no different. Gases near the surface of the Earth warm and rise. As they rise, they cool and sink back down. This forms what we know as the convective cells of the atmosphere. There are three that play important roles in the development of weather. Hadley cells stretch from the equator up to about 30 degrees north and south. These cells produce warm, dry conditions throughout the majority of their spread, with the exception of at the equator, where they meet at the intertropical convergence zone. Here, two Hadley cells meet with warm, rising air. It is here that most of the world's tropical rainforests occur. Feral cells form in the range between 30 and 60 degrees north and south. Where they meet Hadley cells, cool, dry air sinks and is warmed by the surface of the Earth, which receives relatively abundant sunlight. It is at this meeting point where the majority of the world's hot deserts form. From 60 to 90 degrees north and south, polar cells form. Where polar and feral cells meet, warm, moist air rises. Here we have our temperate biomes like temperate deciduous forests. Where two polar cells meet at 90 degrees north and south, the air is cold and dry, leading to the formation of tundras and our cold deserts. But these interacting convective cells are not the only things that contribute to the movement of air in the atmosphere. Because the Earth rotates on its axis, and this rotation causes the equator to move much faster than the point directly at the poles, objects do not move in a straight line. Winds, formed by the movement of air masses of differing temperatures and densities, curve or deflect. In the northern hemisphere, the winds will deflect to the right or in a clockwise motion. In the southern hemisphere, the winds deflect to the left or counterclockwise. Where the two meet at the equator, the doldrums form. At this point, very little wind, if any, occurs. Now that we understand the components of the atmosphere, we can take the next step to understand how these components work together to form our climate and weather patterns. While many will confuse or conflate the two, climate and weather are not the same thing. The easiest way to think about it is that climate is what you expect and weather is what you get. 
Climate is defined by the average temperatures and precipitation over at least a 30 year period. This provides enough data to see commonalities and make long term predictions about how a particular area might behave. Weather, however, changes over the period of days or even hours. Weather includes precipitation, temperature, wind speed and direction, and barometric pressure, among other things. These are things that can change quickly and often occur over only a short period of time. One very specific weather pattern that you should be familiar with is the El Nino and La Nina pattern, also known as the El Nino Southern Oscillation, or ENSO. These weather patterns take place in the Southern Pacific Ocean between South America and Australia and are characterized by changes in four basic conditions, thermocline, upwelling, surface temperature, and trade winds. Before we look at these in the context of these weather patterns, let's define them. Thermocline refers to the area of transition between warm water and cold water. A flatter thermocline means that there is a much more drastic difference in temperature. You expect this when you get into a pool. The surface is relatively warm while the lower parts are cool or even cold. A steeper thermocline indicates a more gradual change. The steepness of the thermocline plays a key role in upwelling, which is the process where cold, nutrient-rich water comes up from the deep parts toward the surface. Increased thermoclines are associated with increased upwelling, which leads to greater fish growth and fish stock. Surface temperature refers to the average temperature of the water. The trade winds are a particular wind pattern that occurs in these areas. Stronger trade winds are associated with cooler surface temperatures, while weaker trade winds are associated with warmer temperatures. In the diagram, you see three different conditions. The center demonstrates the normal or the Walker circulation pattern. These are the conditions in this area as they occur when it is not an El Nino or La Nina year, which happens on a two to five year cycle. When discussing the conditions that are associated with these weather patterns, we are always comparing them to normal conditions. The good thing about remembering these weather patterns is that they are exact opposites of each other. In an El Nino system, the trade winds become weaker stalling the warm water in between South America and Australia. This leads to increased surface temperatures, which causes the thermocline to flatten. This flattened thermocline leads to lower upwelling. El Nino years are characterized by warm and wet conditions in the US and dry drought-like conditions in Australia and Asia. In a La Nina year, the exact opposite happens. Strong trade winds carry warm water further toward Australia leaving average surface temperatures lower than the normal cycle. This causes a steep thermocline, which encourages upwelling. This pattern often causes cool and dry conditions in the US and warm, wet, and sometimes flooding conditions in Australia and Asia. The following slide provides you with an opportunity to see how some of these ideas are connected together. Feel free to pause the video and explore the connections between these topics. Then use the statements at the beginning to review.